Let's talk about the difference between panel boards and load centers. So you might have heard me talk in other videos about like this part of the panel is called the panel board. You know, this whole part can come out and that this is just the cutout box. That's still accurate. So in as much as code mentions the word panel board, it's talking about this entire part. So this is still a panel board in here, but they call this entire thing a panel board where they call this entire thing a load center. So if you were to go to Home Depot, you're probably very familiar. This whole entire thing pre-assembled comes together. Sometimes it has breakers, sometimes it doesn't have breakers, but you pull it all out of a box. It's manufactured together as a load center. Load center is not a code term. It's more of just a marketing term, how they distinguish between a lot of these commercial and industrial products versus largely residential products. Now you can still use load centers in commercial. There's nothing that says that you can't. It's just that more often in commercial, we want a clean cabinet that we can use, cut our own holes. A lot of the work is exposed work. So we want something that's really clean and easy to you know, space out our own holes and run conduit out of and things like that. With these, we got all of these knockouts everywhere. So like you can't really line up a whole row of like three quarter conduit to come out of this. Plus it's flush mounted, right? It's meant to just be in the wall. So if you have anything that's coming in, kind of doesn't matter where everything is lined up because it's all gonna get hidden by drywall anyways. So load centers generally come as a, a flush mount. So that means that you can push the entire panel inside of the chase. Once you put drywall on it, it is flush with that drywall. This is what we consider surface mount. So I actually mounted this and I want this thing to be on the surface of the wall. Now they also do make surface mount load centers. So you can still get something that looks like that that is surface mounted or a lot of times you can get like an outdoor panel that has like a hinged cover or something and it's all weatherproof. So they do make these in a lot of different variations. But typically when we're talking about a commercial panel board, we mean that we are gonna spec a certain interior. The interior is this panel board, breakers, everything. So the interior comes usually in a different box. And then you buy a cabinet and you'll have a panel cover as well, but it's all separate pieces that you have to assemble. So a lot of times on a commercial job, I'll have like seven different panels that I've got to put in and I'll take the enclosures and I'll mount all of the enclosures. And then, you know, we might come back a different day and we'll take this entire t interior and set it in there and bolt it all in place, start putting all the breakers in that we want, but it's largely built out in the field. Whereas in residential, most of the time when I buy a load center, I just pull this thing out and pop it in and run my wires into it. So it's just a little bit different process. Now, another thing that you're gonna notice is there's a large difference between the breakers in here. So in a normal load center, you're just gonna have what are called MCBs, they're miniature circuit breakers. A lot of times in these heavier duty panel boards in commercial, you're gonna have molded case circuit breakers, which is an MCCB. Now, another thing that I wanted to show you guys is on these MCCBs, a lot of times you have trip sensitivity settings that you can adjust. There's a little dial in here that allows you to adjust the sensitivity of the breaker. And every breaker is gonna have, oh, every inverse time breaker is gonna have a trip curve. And inverse time just means the more current that flows, the quicker the breaker is gonna trip. There's an inverse relationship between current flow and time. So with these, there's a trip curve graph that allows over time, it kind of ramps up exponentially. And where you enter your time delay on that trip curve can be adjusted. So if I want this thing to wait a little bit longer before tripping, a lot of times you can go to this trip sensitivity and you can adjust them a little bit to get this thing to hold until there's actually a real like thermal problem or a real like huge amount of current. Um, it just might be set too sensitive from the factory. And this is a 20 and this is a 100 and this is a 30. So they're all the same size, kind of like it is over here. I mean, most of the time, if you have a two pole 20, two pole 30, two pole 60, two pole 80, it's always gonna be the same size breaker, but there's a lot different ratings when it comes to large breakers like this versus small breakers. And that is the AIC rating or the interrupting rating of the breaker. So for those of you who don't know that most of the time when we have a panel, we have a handle rating. We say it's a 20 amp breaker. It means that whatever's printed on this handle is the maximum amount of current that this breaker can handle having sustained current going through it. What I mean by that is a 20 amp breaker is meant to have 20 amps of current flowing through it all day long. It's once we exceed that and go above that, that it needs to be able to trip. So it either needs to be able to creep up really slowly beyond that and do a thermal trip. 
at about 120 to 130% of whatever that current rating is, whatever that handle number is. And then we also have to have short circuit protection. So a short circuit or a ground fault happens, usually 200% or more of that breaker, it needs to be able to trip as well. But there's also a maximum that the breaker can handle without exploding. And that's what the AIC rating is. So with these miniature circuit breakers, you'll see that this has a 10,000 amp symmetrical effective max. So that means 10,000 amps is the max that this breaker can handle. Anytime you have a short circuit, depending on the length of the conductors, the size of the conductors, there's a certain amount of available fault current at this point where these conductors terminate. So and that's gonna dictate what amount of current is gonna flow during a fault. You might have like 600 amps that flows and you think, oh, it's just a 20 amp breaker. Well, yeah, but fault current's way different. It's gonna run unimpeded as much as it can. So you might have hundreds or thousands of amps. That's why these breakers have to be 10,000 max. After 10,000 amps flow through this during a, a short or a ground fault, this thing is gonna be damaged. So that's what the interrupting rating is. What's the maximum that it can handle? Now there's also differences in breakers. Some breakers just stab in like this. So you hook them and stab them. There's no bolting or anything that you have to do. And then there's bolt-in breakers. So some of the load centers are bolt-on style load centers that actually have little holes in there that you have to mount. You have to secure this thing in place and then bolt it so you can't just pull it out. That's pretty common in commercial load centers. Um, but you'll notice that this panel board has that. So every single one of these breakers, each pole on here is bolted in place. So there's no way this thing's gonna come loose, it's gonna arc or have any kind of weird stuff happen to it because everything is bolted very, very securely in place. But that's not something that's unique to just commercial panel boards. A lot of the times these load centers have it too. Now there are, in little MCBs, you can get larger interrupting ratings. So you can get breakers that are typically a little bit larger in their body. They look very similar, uh, but they just have a different rating stamped on them, meaning they have a higher available fault current or a higher interrupting rating that it can withstand. With these, they're much larger, so we have a lot more threshold in our AIC rating. So this is rated for 65,000 amps. That's six times the, the size, six times the amount of current that can flow without this thing actually damaging. Now, you might notice something a little different about these breakers is they look like they're four pole breakers, right? So we've got one, two, three, four, four different screws on here and they're taking up four spots in the panel. And it's because each one of these is a GFCI breaker. So that's what these little buttons are. You've got GFCI test, just like a normal GFCI breaker would work inside of one of these panels. But with these, they're three phase GFCI breakers. So whereas we're kind of used to like normally a single pole breaker that has a little red button on it that allows us to do a GFCI breaker on a single pole load or like a two pole load a lot of times for EVs in houses or for hot tubs and things like that, we'll have like a two pole GFCI breaker. But it's not often that you're seeing three pole GFCI breakers. So if you have a three phase load that still needs GFCI protection, they've got a whole bunch of different options. These are all 20s. This is a 30 and this is a 100. So if you need a three pole 100 GFCI breaker, this is a great panel to choose from. So if you are looking for a three pole GFCI system or a system that can handle that, there's a link in the description below. You should check these things out. Now, both these panel boards and load centers, you can get them in MLO configurations where it's just lugs. We call that main lug only or you can get an MBR configuration where there's already a main breaker in it. So in all of these cases, these were MLO panels. It's just that I got a main, which this is a 225 amp main that I installed in here. So as I built this, I just put the cabinet up first. I put the interior in second. I mounted the main to it and then I put all the breakers in. So with this cabinet, I fully assembled the entire thing out in the field and then I can configure it however I need to configure it. With this load center, I don't have to do anything. I just throw this panel in and I'm good to go. I could have gotten a main breaker kit and that's what these are for. You might be looking at this too. If you guys haven't seen this panel before, like why is there so much space? Did he mount that wrong? And no, this actually came just like this, but they do give you more space in case you have a main that you wanna put in here and land your wires on top of that main. But largely pre-assembled and easily configurable out in the field. You get a lot higher heavy duty ratings with these commercial panel boards than you do with the uh, residential load centers. Largely when you're dealing with load centers, you're gonna be in the wall. And with panel boards, you're generally gonna be surface mount. That way, if I need to tap a whole bunch of holes in here and I want all my conduit to be perfectly spaced and come up out of it, everything's surface mount. 
every bit of the conduit's gonna be seen and I'm just coming down the wall into an enclosure. I don't have to go into the wall to do stuff like I would with a load center. Okay, so the last thing that I wanna finish on is you might notice there's a difference between these bus bars, right? These are copper bus bars, these are aluminum bus bars, so there is a difference Generally, copper is more expensive, so a lot of times when you buy a panel that has copper bus bars, you're going to pay a little bit more than you would if it had aluminum bus bars. Also, copper is about 60% more conductive than aluminum, which is why a lot of times if you see like a 200 amp service, we would feed 2 watt copper in to get that 200 amps, but we would feed 4 watt aluminum because there's more internal resistance to the aluminum, so we kind of have to upsize that wire a bit. There's also thermal properties, so the thermal resistivity, because copper has less internal resistance than aluminum does, that thermal resistance is going to allow for more current flow without having to resize something where you wouldn't be able to do that with aluminum. Now with the thermal reactivity, there's also thermal expansion that can happen. So when you have aluminum, aluminum is a lot more sensitive to changes in temperature coefficients. So if you have heating and cooling and heating and cooling, that aluminum is gonna expand and contract more, whereas copper is not going to nearly as bad. And the last thing is the actual terminations themselves. When you have a termination and you expose any of these copper or aluminum to um, air or to moisture, both of them can rust, sort of. They oxidize or they build up a layer of oxidization, which a lot of times if you see anything aluminum that's outside, you'll notice this kind of graying over the, the surface of it. It's not shiny anymore, but you'll notice with copper too, copper develops this little bit of like green patina over the top of it. So when these things oxidize, the cool thing about copper is that oxidization doesn't cause any lower surface resistance. So if you have a termination to something and it oxidizes, it's still a conductive oxidized point. So it still maintains its conductivity, but the oxide that forms on aluminum doesn't have that same conductivity. So you actually have to clean that aluminum stuff off to maintain the connection electrically. So hope you guys learned a bunch of things. Love you crazy people. I'll see you in the next one. Mm-hmm.